Chapter 10 The Voyage All that night we were in a great bustle getting things stowed in their place and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like, coming off to wish us a good voyage and a safe return. We never had a night at the Admiral Benbow when I had half the work, and I was dog-tired when, a little before dawn, the boatswain sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the captain's capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck, for all, so, all was so new and interesting to me. The brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle, the men bustling to their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. Now, barbecue, tip us a stave, cried one voice. The old one cried another. Aye, aye, mate, said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out into an air that I knew the words so well. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. Yo, ho, ho. <laughs> Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. And the whole cor crew bore chorus. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. At the end of the third ho, drove the bars before them with a will. Even at the exciting moment, it carried me back to the old Admiral Benbow in a second. And I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in the chorus. But soon the anchor was shored up, and soon it was hanging dripping at the bows. Soon the sails began to draw on the land and shipping to flit by on either side. And before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. I'm not going to relate the voyage in detail. It was very pre fairly preposterous. The ship proved to be a good ship, the crew were capable seamen, and the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which require to be known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, and the people did what they pleased with him. But it was by no means the worst of it, for after a day or two at sea he began to appear on deck with a hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself, sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. Sometimes, for a day or two, he would be almost sober and attend to his work at least passably. In the meantime, we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we please, we could do nothing to solve it, and we asked him to his face. He would only laugh if he were drunk, and if he were sober, deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. He was not only useless as an officer and a bad influence amongst the men, but it was plain that at this rate he must soon kill himself outright, so that nobody was much surprised nor very sorry when one dark night with a hard head sea he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. Overboard, said the captain. Well, gentlemen, that saves me the trouble of putting him in irons. But there we were without a mate, and it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The boatswain, Job Anderson, was the likeliest man aboard. Though he kept his old title, he served in a way as mate. Mr. Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful, for he often took a watch himself in easy weather. And the coxswain, Israel Hands, was a careful, wily, old, experienced seaman, who could be trusted at a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me on to speak of our ship's cook, Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard ship, he carried his crutch by a lanyard around his neck, so as to have both hands free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against the bulkhead and propped against it, yielding to every moment of the ship, get on with his cooking like someone safe ashore. Still more strange was it to see him in the heaviest of weather cross the deck. He had a line or two rigged up to help him cross the widest spaces. Long John's earrings, they were called, and he would hand himself from one place to another, now using the crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard, and quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who sailed with him before expressed their pity to see him so reduced. He's no common man, Barbecue, said the coxswain to me. He's always, he's had good schooling in his young days, so he can speak like a book when so minded, and brave, a lion's nothing alongside of Long John. I've seen him grapple four and knock their heads together, him unharmed. All the crew respected and even obeyed him. 
He had a way of talking to each and doing everybody some particular service. To me, he was unweariedly kind and always gave to, always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin, the dishes hanging up burnished and his parrot in a cage in one corner. Come away, Hawkins, he would say. Come and have a yarn with John. Nobody more welcomes than yourself, my son. Sit you down and hear the news. Here's Captain Flint. I call my parrot Captain Flint after the famous buccaneer. Here's Captain Flint predicting success to our voyage. Wasn't you, Captain? And the pirate would say with great rapidity, Pieces of eight, pieces of eight, pieces of eight, till you wondered that it was not out of breath, or till John threw his handkerchief over the cage. Now that bird, he would say, is maybe 200 years old, Hawkins. They live forever, mostly. And if anyone's seen more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate. She's been at Madagascar, at Malabar, and Suriname, and Providence, and Portobello. She was in the fishing up of the old wrecked plate ships. If she's learned pieces of eight, and little wonder, 350,000 of them, Hawkins. She was at the boarding of the Viceroy of the Indies, out of Goa, she was. And to look at her, you would think she was a babby. But you smelt powder, didn't you, Captain? Stand to go about, the parrot would scream. Ah, she's a handsome craft, she is, the cook would say, and give her sugar from his pocket. And then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on, passing belief for wickedness. There, John would say, you can't touch pit, should not be mucked, lad. Here's the old innocent bird of mine swearing blue fire, and none of the wiser you may lay to that. She would swear the same in a manner of speaking before chaplain. And John would touch his forelock in a solemn way, and we had the way he had that made me think he was the best of men. In the meantime, the squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty, pretty distant terms with one another. The squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the captain. The captain, on his part, never spoke but when he was spoken to, and then sharp and short and dry and not a word wasted. He owned, when driven into a corner, that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, that some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see, and all had behaved fairly well. As for the ship, he had taken a downright fancy to her. She'll lie a point nearer to the wind than a man has right to expect of his own married wife, sir. But, he would add, all I have to say is we're not going home again and I don't like the cruise. We're not home again and I don't like the cruise. The squire at this would turn away and march up and down the deck, chin in air. A trifle more of that man, he would say, and I shall explode. We had some heavy weather which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and they must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise. For it is my belief there was never a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, and for instance, if the squire heard it was any man's birthday and always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for anyone to help himself that had a fancy. Never knew good to come of it yet, the captain said to Dr. Lavezzi. Spoil the forecastle hands, make the devils, that's my belief. But good did come from the apple barrel, as you shall hear. For if it had not been for that, we should have had no note of warning, and might have all perished by the hand of treachery. This was how it came about. We had run up the trades to get wind of the island we were after. I'm not allowed to be more plain, and now we were running down for it with a bright outlook day and night. It was about the last day of our outward voyage by the largest computation. Sometime that night, or at latest before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. We were heading south-southwest and had a steady breeze abeam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipped her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing alow and aloft. Everyone was in the bravest spirits because we were now so near an end to the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should pull an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all forward, looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail and whistling away gently to himself, and that was the only sound excepting the swish of the sea against the bows and the sides of the ship. I got bodily into the apple barrel and found there was scarce an apple left. But sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking moment of the ship, 
I had either fallen asleep or was at the point of doing so when a heavy man sat down with a rather clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I heard a dozen words, I would not have been shown I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there trembling and listening in the extreme fear and curiosity. For from those dozen words, I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended on me alone. This is the end of chapter 10. Man, that is a cliffhanger. It's like, okay, what was Silver talking about? What was he, what did he say that scared Jim? Why is it going to be the, you know, why is Jim the only one who can save all the honest men? He climbed into the apple barrel, which is... He climbed into the apple barrel trying to get one and then just ended up staying there and I'm not sure how he managed to turn around in an apple barrel I guess someone a little bit bigger than you could do that but I mean apple barrels are not that big anyway he was hiding inadvertently overheard silver now another nautical term that is in the book bosun is not spelled anywhere close to how you would think bosun spelled well you get the first two letter right b-o-a-t-s-w-a-i-n so he is this is kind of an archaic term um you know boat is obvious then the swain at the end so he's the swain of the boat which is i'm trying to remember Swain was is like an old English word that is kind of a leader. Um, I'll have to look it up. Look in the comments. The comments will have more etymology. But anyway, so bosun, B-O-A-T-S-W-A-I-N, goes along with folksal from last week. Um, and that's... These words just get contracted and contracted and contracted, and you never can really tell... You know, you see this big long word, it's like two syllables. And that's the way it goes, but uh, the language changes. And man, that's a cliffhanger. Man, I may just do another chapter and then, nah. Nah, one chapter. One chapter a day, that's the deal. Talk to you later.